continue with our question and answers. And we're going to try and answer three questions tonight. And the first question is, who are the Laodiceans? Why was their church lukewarm? If you will turn with me to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 22. Uh, now, the first question is, who are the Laodiceans? And so uh, what I'll do first is I'll give just a little historical backdrop on the city. And one of the reasons that's important is because many of the things that are unique about their city, Jesus mentions in, their, in his letter to them to make a point. Now, Laodicea was a Greek city in the region of Phrygia a region that is in modern-day Turkey or in Asia Minor. And this eventually became a Roman province and a wealthy one at that. Uh, in fact, it was the wealthiest city within the region of Phrygia. Now, materially speaking, they were an economic powerhouse for many reasons. The uh, center of banking was there in Laodicea for all of Asia Minor uh, in that very city. It was also world famous for its clothing industry. They would produce a, a glossy, dark type of material for their clothes, and it, it was popular worldwide. They also had a prominent medical school there, and this medical school would produce a ta tablet called Phrygian powder, and it was exported worldwide to help people with their eye problems. And in fact, they were so wealthy uh, and so independent that when their city was devastated by an earthquake in 60 AD, the, the government of Rome offered them money to help them rebuild. But they said no. Now, Tacitus, who is a historian, implied that was unusual, but I don't think we need a historian to see how unusual that is. Typically, if, if someone is in need of help, someone has a lot of uh, property damage, they'll typically accept money to help. You know, when was the last time you heard of anyone deny, like, saying no to federal funding for help? I can't remember the last time, but apparently they were so wealthy they said, no, we got this, we're good. So that gives you an idea of how much money they had. And unfortunately, as we'll see when we look at this passage, this is one of their problems. They were, they were putting too much trust in their wealth. Now, let's talk about the Laodicean church. We don't have a lot of information on its founding, but it is possible that its founding was, uh, that the church there was founded in, in the very first year of the church. That is possible. We know from Acts chapter 2, verse 10, that there were those from Phrygia in the assembly that heard Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. So people there could have become Christians and, and taken, their, taken their faith back to Phrygia and maybe even to the city of Laodicea. We also know in Acts chapter 18, verse 23, that Paul in his missionary journey stopped there to encourage the brethren that were there. He may have made a stop to Laodicea because the church may have been in existence at that time. But we know at least for certain, by the time Paul writes the book of Colossians, there is a church there in Laodicea. And apparently it's a church that Paul has written to. Paul says in Colossians chapter 4, verse 16, when this letter is read among you, have it read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. So by the time Jesus sends them a message in Revelation chapter 3 by the hand of uh, the Apostle John, they have likely been in, their church has likely been in existence anywhere from three to six decades. So they should have been a, a very mature congregation, but unfortunately, that's not what we read. So if you will, turn with me to Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 14 through 22. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. Excuse me, uh, cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot, so that because you, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may become rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, 
and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, we know that in, in uh, Revelations, Revelation, not Revelations, just to be a little technical, the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and chapter 3, Jesus sends a letter through the hand of Paul to seven churches. And often when he does, he'll give a praise or a few praises to these churches, letting them know what they're doing well and what they need to continue doing. Now, when unfortunately he writes to the church at Laodicea, he doesn't say anything good at all, at least not in reference to what they are doing. And now how would you feel if Jesus sent you a personal letter? Now, I know I would love to receive a personal letter from Jesus. I know South Seminole would uh, love to receive a personal letter from uh, Jesus. But, you know, if it didn't say anything good, it would probably be disheartening. You know, as we saw towards the end, everything he said was out of love, but he couldn't find anything good to say about it. I'm, not, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't have that problem, but still, nonetheless, we can imagine how crushing this would be to hear. Now, Jesus criticizes them for being lukewarm. And how most people often interpret that phrase or that idea is that Jesus is saying that they were neither hot as an on fire for God, on fire for him, and they were neither cold, that is completely against him. Now, I, I don't think that's the best way to interpret that phrase for several reasons. Because if you interpret that, that teaching that way, Jesus is basically saying, is that I'd rather you be for me or completely against me. I don't think we have an idea in the New Testament and the Old Testament where Jesus has you know, ever said to anyone, well, I'd rather have you completely against me. Now, we do find the idea, for example, in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 10 through 15, that if you are in rebellion against God, God doesn't want your sacrifice or your prayers uh, because you have turned against him. But we never find the idea that God wants anyone to be lost or to turn against him. We know that God desires all men to repent and to come to the knowledge of the truth. But I, I think what Jesus is doing is he's impotent. He's using something that they're familiar with in their day and age to make a specific point. And I think this has to do more with their usefulness than them being you know, on fire for God, which that certainly can be a problem. Uh, we know that one of the neighbors to the city of Laodicea was Hierapolis. They were just to the north. And this city had hot springs. And you know, for those of you who have had the luxury of going to a hot spring, they're very relaxing, they're very therapeutic, they're very useful. You can do a lot with hot water. You can bathe in it, you can relax in it, you can clean with it, you can do a lot with hot water. And to the, to the east of the church at Laodicea, there was the city of Colossae, where there was another church there. And at this city, they had a large supply of cold, refreshing water. Now, there are several things you can do with cold water, too, especially if you're tired, you're worn out, and you've had a long day's work, especially outside, you want to enjoy cold water. However, the church at Laodicea got its water supply from hot springs, although these hot springs were several miles away. So by the time it got to Laodicea, it was both cold and hot. It was lukewarm. And you don't do as much with lukewarm water as you can with, for example, hot water or cold water. So, you know, of course, I think we would easily conclude that Jesus is not criticizing the, the, their drinking supply. What he's likely criticizing is their utility. What Jesus is likely saying, well, if you're hot, I could do something with you. If you're cold, I could do something with you. But you're, luke, you're lukewarm. Now I can't do anything with you at all. I would rather spit you out of my mouth. And that literally translates to, to vomit. They, they had become so useless that they were, in a sense, disgusting to Jesus, that Jesus didn't want to use them for anything. Now, of course, uh, you know, the original question was, why were they lukewarm? We see why they were lukewarm, likely because they had lost some type of utility that, that, that Jesus couldn't use them in his work. 
But why was this the case? Well, as we see in verses 17 through 18, which we'll go ahead and read again, it appears that they had become too dependent on their material blessings. <clears throat> let's look at verses 18 and 19. No, actually, let's, let's look at verse 17. 17 and 18, that's right. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and and white garments, uh, excuse me, and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. What we see here in verse 17 is that they were too confident in their material goods. They had the attitude that, hey, I'm wealthy, I'm rich, I don't need anything at all. Now, of course, we know that God does not discourage hard work, money, or independence. We know from books such as the book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes, the books of First and Second Thessalonians, that God always encourages independence and hard work and being able to take care of yourself and being able to make enough to share with those uh, who are in need. But there is a difference between being independent versus putting your faith in these material things. And it appears that's what the church at Laodicea was doing. Because they were so wealthy, because they made so much money, because their city was so wealthy, they were putting their faith and their confidence in these physical things. And apparently it was affecting their faith. This is something that uh, Jesus teaches against in Matthew chapter 19. If you'll turn with me, excuse me, Matthew chapter 6, if you'll turn with me there. Matthew chapter 6, and we'll read verses 19 through 21. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. One of the things that Jesus always emphasizes in his teachings is the fleetingness of wealth. You know, there's something that feels good about having money in your bank account. It makes you feel safe and secure. But money, gold and silver, these things all fade over time. Even the dollar, unfortunately, is subject to inflation and losing its value. Uh, I remember about a decade ago or 15 years ago, I would go to the store, I might have a dollar, and I could buy a candy bar. Now most candy bars cost $2.50, and it's so frustrating because now I never want to buy them because it seems too much. And, and, and I know maybe some of you who are just a tad older, you probably remember when candy bars were $0.50 cents or $0.40 cents or maybe even $0.25. Cents. And you know, maybe it's also frustrating for you, at least I can imagine, but everything physical loses value over time. And what Jesus you know, always emphasized, and what he's emphasizing to the church at Laodicea is that they should put their faith in things of eternal consequence, things that really matter. And so what he does, what he tells them, he says, instead of focusing on the gold that you have, buy gold from me and invest in me. It kind of reminds me uh, as to, to what he tells the woman at the well in John chapter 4. She was so concerned on water that Jesus uses that idea of water and he, 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 he makes a comparison to eternal life. How eternal life provides you with everything you need where you will never thirst. And so he's doing the same thing with the church at Laodicea because they were so concerned with gold. He says, I have the gold that matters. He, says, he basically says, you know, you produce you know, all this eye medicine, but you don't see how blind and naked you really are. Buy medicine from me, learn from me, and you'll see what you need to. You will see how you really are. And also, one of the things I think is interesting, we know that they produced uh, black, cl black clothes, uh, and, and they exported them all throughout the world. He says, well, instead, buy white robes from me. Now, I don't know if there's anything you know, negatively symbolic about black clothes. Probably not. I think the idea is Jesus is making a contrast between the clothes that they felt so confident in versus the clothing that he provided. Now, b because they were so self-reliant, it appears that God couldn't find a use for them. Now, now, God can do anything with a person who is willing to humble themselves before them, but because they had become so self-reliant... 
Jesus no longer had a use for them. They were not like hot water, which you can find several uses for. They were not like cold water that you can find several uses for. They had become lukewarm. And to Jesus, that was a very disgusting thing. To, to Jesus, a, a useless Christian is a very disgusting and terrible thing. But he doesn't end on a bad note. Notice what he says in verse 19. He says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. What he has said, it has been out of love. It's not because he just wants to beat them over the head with the Bible or with the word of God. It's because he loves them. And he has taken the time to write this letter through John so that they will change. And as, as we're about to see, to, to have the same relationship that he had with them before. Let's look at verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. I, I think this is a very tender picture here. You know, it's a picture of Jesus simply waiting outside the door, waiting patiently for them to repent. Now, of course, we know Jesus will not be patient forever, but for the time being, he was very patient with them. He wanted them to repent. All they had to do was open the door, that is, repent, and he would come in and dine with them. Now, I think we would all like to sit down and, and have a meal with Jesus, but in, in ancient cultures, dining specifically, or sitting down having a meal with someone, was, was a deep sign of fellowship. It was a, it was a sign of friendship friendship and communion. Jesus is basically saying that, you know, there's separation between us right now, but if you repent, we can go back to having the same relationship we had before. And not only that, he gives them the promise that if they repent, that they will have a reward, a reward and a great one at that. Notice what we see in verse 21. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, I think that's a very peculiar verse, and I, I think you probably uh, feel the same way. We know that when Jesus completed his mission here on earth, God rewarded him. And it appears he was rewarded with God's own throne to have a place of honor, glory, and authority. Now, I'm not sure you know, we get the exact same thing Jesus does, but what Jesus is, seems to be saying is that the reward he received for overcoming this life is something he is going to share with us to some degree. And I, you know, I, I think if a reward is good enough for Jesus, it's more than good enough for us. And I, I think this is a very heartwarming thing because uh, I know, unfortunately, many Christians get discouraged. And when they fall away, they get too discouraged to sometimes come back because they feel so defeated. But I think even as we plainly see here that even if a Christian struggles or falls away, Jesus still wants them back. He still wants to share his rewards with them if only they would simply repent. And of course, this is not just true for, for uh, Christians who have fallen away, but for people who have never come to him in the first place. If only they would repent and, and turn to him, Jesus would share his rewards with them. So the question was, you know, who, is the, who are the Laodiceans and why was their church lukewarm? Well, the church at Laodicea was what appears to be a very wealthy congregation and a congregation, unfortunately, that depended too much on their wealth and made them lukewarm and made them useless. It made them to the point where they where Jesus could not do anything with them. And so Jesus writes this letter to encourage them to repent so that he could find a use for them and one day share his reward with them. Now the next question will be from John chapter 14. If you want to, go ahead and turn to John 13 because we'll stop there. The next question is, can you explain John 14 verses 1 through 3? Is it literal or figurative? Now we have to remember that uh, in the, in the context of John 13, 14, 15, and even 16, this is Jesus' last meal with his disciples. This is the last time he's going to be able to sit down and, and, uh, and, teach, them and, and teach them and encourage them before he is crucified. Now, it appears there are some teachings on the way to Gethsemane, but this is one of the last formal times he's going to be able to sit down, have a meal with them. And he knows that they're going to have some great difficulties ahead, many difficulties that they don't even realize yet. 
And so one of the things we see he does in John chapter 13 is he washes his disciples' feet to, to prepare them to be the kind of leaders they need to be in the church. They don't need to be the kind of leaders that lord their authority over people, but who use their positions to serve the church and to serve the people of God. He is also preparing them to love with the same sacrificial love that he has loved them with. He is also preparing them for the fact that one of their very own will betray them, and most notably him. And he's also preparing them for the fact that Jesus is leaving them and they will be without him for some time. And he's also preparing them for the fact that they will indeed all turn away that night. So he seeks to comfort them and to encourage them in any way that he can. Now let's look at John chapter 13 and let's look at verses 31 through 38 first. Therefore, when he had gone out, that's talking about Judas, when Judas had, had left the table to go betray him. Therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now talking to his disciples, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and, glor and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify him in himself, and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. Ye will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. So one of the things that Jesus is emphasizing is the idea that he is going away. And as he begins to talk about how they should love, it appears that Peter's too distracted by the first point. He's like, well, hold on, let, let's go back. Wait, wait, you're leaving. And Jesus says, yes, I'm leaving. He's like, well, why can't I go with you right now? I, I think it's actually a very beautiful picture. Uh, you know, Jesus may have been a little frustrated, but I think it shows Peter's tenacity and, and love for Jesus. It al almost reminds me of, of a son or a daughter knowing that their father is going to go away on a business trip. And they say, well, why can't I go with you right now? And the, you know, the parent tries to explain, well, you can't come with me right now, but I'll come back later. And, and it's something that's very difficult for them to understand. It appears it's very difficult for Peter to understand what is about to happen. And, and it's also very, uh, as Jesus knows, it's going to be very difficult for his disciples. So he then goes on to explain uh, why they should be encouraged and not lose heart. Let's look at verses one through, uh, chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, Jesus, one of the first things he says is to encourage their faith. He he says, you know, believe in God, believe in Jesus, believe in God, believe in me, because he knows their faith is going to be tested severely that very night. And then he goes on to encourage them. He talks about how there are places for them in his father's house. So let's explore this idea of, a father's, uh, of his father's house. Now, uh, I'll be honest, this part of Jesus' statement kind of threw me for a loop. I had to do a lot of studying on this because the way that Jesus uses my father's house in this verse is the only way he uses it in this specific context. Whenever Jesus uses the idea elsewhere of my father's house, it's always to refer to the temple, but that doesn't really make sense here. And if you look at the idea of God's house or the Lord's house in the Old Testament, it nearly always refers to the temple. But then again, this doesn't fit here. Now, of course, I think we can easily conclude that he's talking about heaven. But why does he use this idea of my father's house? Well, what Jesus is likely expressing is a practice that would have been very familiar to the apostles or to the disciples of that time. 
You see, in ancient uh, times in the Orient, if, if you live, for example, uh, in Palestine, it was not uncommon for a wealthy man who had a lot of money to build a house big enough, not just for him and his wife, but for all of his children and their children as well. That probably seems a little bit unusual in, in Western culture. Uh, we, we try to raise up our kids to go and have their own house somewhere else. Uh, but this wouldn't have been uncommon in, in Jesus' time, and this is not uncommon in places like India today. Uh, even uh, uh, people from India who move over here, if they're very wealthy, they can build a big house. It's not uncommon for them to build a huge house for their kids and their grandkids as well. It's not because their, their children are lazy. It's just they love their family so much that they all want to live together in one house. And so that's probably what Jesus was, that's probably the idea that, that Jesus is expressing here. That, you know, one day, well, right now we're going to be apart. I'm going to go and dwell in my father's house, but I'm going to come back and we're all going to be together in the same place. And Jesus talks about, uh, the New American Standard Bible says that there are many dwelling places. That's a little vague, but probably accurate. The ESV says in my father's house there are many rooms. It probably captures the idea the King James and the New King James use the word mansion. Now, uh, the word mansion probably meant something very different than it uh, does uh, today. 400 years ago, it may have had a different connotation, but typically when we use the word mansion today, we have the idea of having a huge, luxurious house full of very fancy things. Now, I'm not saying the house of a God isn't going to be fancy or luxurious, but if you translate the word mansion, if you use the word mansion there, it sort of carries it with the idea that we're all going to have our own personal mansions. You're going to have your mansion over here. I'm going to have uh, your mansion over here. I might get a penthouse apartment over here. We're all going to have our fancy dwellings separately. That's not really what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying is that we're going to dwell in God's house, but we're going to have our own individual rooms. We're all going to be in the same place together. And this is something that's emphasized uh, all throughout John's literature, the idea of God and man coming together. We see that here in his gospel. We see that in his letters. We see that especially in the book of Revelation toward the end where, where God and man have their dwelling place in the same location. And Jesus is saying that, you know, that can't be, it can't be that way yet because I have to go and prepare a place for you. But Jesus, Jesus is likely not saying, I have to go get some rooms ready, I have to make some beds. That's probably not what he's saying. What he's emphasizing is the idea that he has to do some things personally so that God and man can be together. And of course, I, I think we understand that uh, it is through his death and it is through his resurrection that he was able to unite God and man. Uh, through his uh, death, he was able to atone for our sins. And through his resurrection, he was able to create an avenue in which we would be able to live forever with God. So the idea of him going to prepare a place likely has the idea of him uh, dying and being resurrected to prepare the opportunity for humanity to dwell in the same presence with God. Now, the, the question originally was, is this figurative or literal? Well, Jesus is talking about very real, very literal things, but he's using some figurative ideas to express it. The idea of houses, or the idea of a house, the idea of a room. You know, what exactly that all looks like, I don't know. But the, the whole point together is that God and man, I should say, God and those faithful to him will all one day be in the same place together. Now, the last question is, okay, that's better. Should we ever rely on or interpret our dreams to any extent? We see in the Bible that God often used dreams and visions to reveal certain prophecies. Uh, it is interesting that we still dream today, but is this mostly a, a psychological response or something sent from God? Well, I think that's an excellent question because we do know in the Old Testament, God would often communicate, I don't know about often, but from time to time, he would communicate with people through, dream, through, through dreams. We see in the case of Abraham in Genesis 15 and Abimelech in, in Genesis chapter 20, the way he communicated them was very clearly. Uh, here's the message I'm giving to you. Here, here, here it is loud and clear. We actually see in, in Genesis chapter 20, verse 3, that the way God talks to Abimelech, it's a back and forth conversation he has with them. 
Uh, we see, for example, in the story of Joseph that God communicates to Joseph through his dreams and other people's dreams, but not in a very clear way, at least not in a clear way to everyone else. He doesn't uh, say exactly what he wants to communicate. He, he gives the people who are dreaming the opportunity to view certain scenes and certain things happening in a very figurative way. But nonetheless, these are dreams from God to communicate a particular message. We also see in Numbers chapter 12, verse 6, that God tells Miriam and Aaron that uh, often when he communicates to his prophets, it is through a dream or a vision or something of that nature. And he says that a little bit in contrast to how he normally spoke to Moses. He would speak to Moses as a friend, face to face. They would have this back and forth conversation, but apparently, uh, often, God would communicate to his other prophets in the, the manner of a dream or a vision. So we see this very often through the Old Testament. Now, are the dreams that we have today a, a biological or psychological response, or are they from God? Well, I, I doubt most of the dreams, if not every dream we have today, is simply psychological in nature. Now, there was a time in the Christian age where God would give dreams to his Christians. Uh, we see this, for example, in uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 17, that God would use dreams to give special messages to his Christians. Uh, Peter says, quoting the prophet Joel, And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour my, forth my spirit on all mankind, in your sons and your daughters, shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. So it appears that one of the miraculous abilities provided by the Holy Spirit was the ability to dream dreams perhaps in a prophetic sense. Uh, and we know that if one had, if, for one to have the possibility uh, of having this kind of dream, they would have to have, their, have the, the apostles lay their hands on them. We see, for example, in Acts chapter 8, verses 12 through 17, it was only the apostles who could lay hands on other people and give them these miraculous abilities, one of the which was prophecy, and perhaps within prophecy, these dreams were include, included. Or, or perhaps, maybe one could argue, dreams were something separate than that. I, I'm no expert when it comes to uh, these kinds of miracles. But we know that there would come a time, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, that this ability would one day go away. These miraculous things would one day cease. And I think we can figure out as to when that would happen. When the apostles died, there was no one else to give these particular gifts to anyone else. And so, you know, whoever had received a gift at that time, they would... Uh, maintain or keep that gift until they died, but there was no way for anyone new to receive these kinds of gifts. So in light of that fact, I, I don't believe anyone should expect dreams from God in a miraculous way today. Uh, now, can dreams be useful? Should they be something we, re we rely on interpret? Well, I, or interpret? I, I think it depends from person to person. I know there are some experts, some psychoanalysts, who you know, will talk to their client and actually use their dreams to help them with their problems. But uh, I'm not sure that works for everyone. We all dream in different ways. Some of us can't remember any of our dreams. Some of our dreams are so weird and incoherent that we probably can't make any sense of them. But there are other people who have uh, lucid dreaming, that is the, the ability to interact with their dreams, to communicate with other people, and to have full awareness while they're in the dream. Now they might find more use out of their dreams than, than maybe I do or maybe you do. And um, you know, maybe they are able to find something useful for their dreams. Uh, in fact, I've heard stories where people have been able to go and interact with certain people, uh, have conversations, and actually work out issues in their life. Now in reference to relying on our dreams, I think we have to be careful about you know, what that means. How do you rely on your dreams? Well, we, sh we shouldn't rely on it in a prophetic, in a miraculous way. Uh, and I don't think we should, we sh I don't think we should use our dreams to make drastic life decisions unless they're very clear, unless perhaps hypothetically your dream sort of gave you an idea as to how you need to handle a particular situation. I'll give just an anecdotal example. Uh, the, the, uh, there's unfortunately not too much data in reference to dreams, but I know personally uh, one time uh, I had these reoccurring dreams that were super annoying. I realized it's because 
there was something in my life I needed to change, I needed to fix. And once you know, I fixed that, those dreams went away. So hypothetically, one could argue that God might providentially allow you to have a dream, maybe to indicate that there's something in your life that you may need to fix. Now, uh, I've never done a survey or study, but if you've ever had any dream like that, why don't you talk to me afterward, and I'll see if there's maybe any consistency. But as of right now, there is no methodology for dream interpretation. And so, you know, if you think your dream is saying something very specific to you, you know, be careful about it, you know, unless it's, it's super clear and obvious. So, in reference to the question, should we rely on or interpret our dreams to any extent? I think it depends on the person, I think it depends on the kind of dreams you have, and I think it depends on how clear it is. Uh, but I don't think we should ever expect, at least in the time that we live today, that our dreams are miraculously from God or a special message like they were in the Old Testament or the New Testament. I don't think there's any information or there's any evidence to indicate that. Now, if you have any questions at all, please remember we, we have the question and answer box in the back, and we'd love to answer your questions as soon as we're able to get to them. But before we conclude tonight, maybe you're here and you're thinking about the church at Laodicea. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, maybe some of the things that Jesus said about them is true of you. Maybe you put too much faith in the things of this life, in the physical things, and maybe you let, maybe it's your bank account, maybe it's your retirement account, uh, maybe it's simply the comforts of this life to be the things that, that give you hope or security for the future instead of trusting on God. Now, if that's the case, Jesus has already said, if you would but open the door, if you would but repent, uh, he will come in and dine with you. He will continue his relationship with you like he did before, if only you repent. And maybe you're here tonight and you realize that you've never been obedient to the gospel, that uh, you've never started your walk with God. And if that's so, all the promises that you have heard tonight about one day dwelling with God, the, the, the promise of, of uh, sharing in Christ's reward to some degree, that can all be for you tonight, if only you would submit to God. So if you're here tonight, if you have any spiritual needs, if, if you'd like to put Christ on in baptism, we, we would love to take your confession and help you with that tonight. If there's anything we can do for you spiritually, please come forward as we stand and sing.